Well, I would like to turn to a couple of questions that we received from our audience. And Arthur Weinstein in California raises the question of the 25th Amendment. Uh, did that ever did that ever come into play in your reporting? Did did either of you find or both of you find evidence that um, uh, uh, that you know there was a serious enough concern about the president's uh, capacities for functioning in the office that anyone ever thought about invoking this? Bob Costa. There is a, a few scenes about this in peril. And the key to focus on here is Vice President Pence, who, as Vice President and the Constitution, could try to invoke the 25th Amendment. And you see after January 6th, Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer, they're trying to nudge Vice President Pence in this direction. And they, they call Vice President Pence in one scene, and they're waiting for him to pick up the phone but he doesn't pick up the phone. Vice President Pence instead talks to his top advisors, including his attorney in the vice president's office, Greg Jacob, one of these little known figures in Washington who actually had an enormous role during this transition period. And his counsel to Pence, along with the counsel of others in the office, is to not invoke the 25th Amendment because they don't see some kind of mental incapacity or health incapacity on the part of President Trump. And because of that, they don't feel it's appropriate to invoke the 25th. But this is a, a contrast to Chairman Milley, for example, who we report believes President Trump was in serious mental decline in the final days of the Trump administration. So the opportunity was there for Vice President Pence to maybe work with congressional leaders to pursue the 25th Amendment. But ultimately, Pence did not decide to do that in the wake. And you see some tensions in our book in Pence's inner circle. Uh, it, there was almost a, a fear, a worry, a, a, a unhappiness that Pence wasn't more angry about what happened on January 6th, wasn't more willing or eager to move against Trump. Do, and do you think Pence really has a future in the Trumpified Republican Party? Um, he was considered, I think, a, a likely potential successor to Trump at one point. The, the story of Pence uh, that we were able to build is uh, what a tale. You could write a book just a, just about that because he wants to accommodate Trump. He, he knows Trump's political power. And so there are scenes where he is uh, looking for a way to join with Trump on this idea of the stolen election. Uh, the key people in Pence's inner circle passionately arguing, no, you can't do it. There is a call from Dan Quayle, former vice president, also from Indiana, uh, telling, uh, literally reading the Constitution and the law to Pence saying, you can't uh, do anything other than formally certify Biden as the coming president. Uh, Pence, uh, you, you, you see him walking uh, this uh, kind of wobbly road for a while. And then at the end, he realizes, no, the Constitution and the, and the law are very clear. And he certified, he oversaw the certification as, uh, of Biden as the winner, which was emotionally, politically very uh, difficult. What it is easily forgotten, and we found in our reporting, if Pence had stood up there before the House and the Senate and said, you know, I can't decide who uh, really won the election and walked away, which he could have done physically and, you know, just say, look, I'm confused, and would have created triggered a constitutional crisis in this country like we've never seen before, because the very legitimacy of who is going to be the next president would be not just in question, but be, you know, what's the process to get there? This is one of the dangers 
uh, that we found. And I, in many ways, it's as important as General Milley's assessments about the national security danger. If we don't have a process that is clear to everyone, this is the next president, we are going to go off the cliff when I say we, this country.